I am Werner Pöwe. Today is June 22nd, 2016. I'm interviewing Professor Wolfgang Oertel from Germany. And we're here at the 20th International Movement Disorder Society Congress in Berlin, in Germany. Wolfgang, thank you for <laughs> coming and telling us a little bit about yourself and of course about your career in the field, mm -hmm. Parkinson's movement disorders. What, what was it that made you become interested when you were, you're still young, but when you were even younger, um, <laughs> did you were interested <coughs> in, in the field of neurology, specifically um, neurosciences and movement disorders? What, what was it that brought you in there? Right. I studied in West Berlin medicine and I met people who did neurophysiology and I was mus most fascinated by people who worked on the cardiovascular control in the brainstem. And I asked this guy whether I could do a thesis and he said, well, he has so many colleagues and young students. So I moved to another place and this guy was Professor Klinke, one of the dominant people in ear research. And I ended up doing neurophysiology of the inner ear of the cat. And so that, if I may interrupt, that was actually in Berlin. You Berlin. were studying yeah, here. Yeah, here yeah. it was now. right here in Berlin. 19, I know exactly, I started on the 1st of May 1972 mm -hmm. in the lab doing, uh, trying to do research. And when I finished this, this was 1977, I realized that in order to understand neurology, I, ha I had not decided not to, to understand the brain, I would need extra training, not in physiology but in chemistry maybe. So I asked around in Berlin and people recommended to go to NIH to a guy called Irvin Kopin, who again worked on hypertension. And was that still in your medical school days? No, after, no just afterwards. After when, you had, when you had graduated and had right. begun your training. No, so I, no, I had not started clinical training. It was right after right, getting the license right. for medical yeah. practice. So I had not started uh, training in neurology. And um, going back to this old interest of looking at the cardiovascular control, I, I said Copen is the right place to go because he looks on uh, transmitters in the blood related to hypertension, or adrenaline. So I, I was lucky enough to get a grant and went there and he said, well, I mean, I, I don't know what you really want, but I want you to purify MAOB. And I said, what is MAOB? <laughs> And after four weeks, I realized that the strategy he had proposed didn't work. He said, don't worry, pull out the next straw and said, I want you to purify glutamic acid decarboxylase. And I said, what is glutamic acid decarboxylase? He said, well, just go next door. They failed for two years. You better join the team. Mm -hmm. So that is how I ended up in purifying a protein, which is the rate-limiting enzyme for gamma aminobutyric acid, the most prominent inhibitor in the brain and that led to basal ganglia because after two years the team was had succeeded to purify GAD, had succeeded to produce an antibody against GAD. This was the time when peptides just showed up and classical transmitters were still the hype. And we were able together with Enrico Mugnaini in Connecticut to map the whole brain GABAergic nervous system. And there we saw... That was in the rat. In the rat, yeah, sure, I'm sorry, yeah, in the rat. And um, then we realized 95% of the striatum are GABAergic, 95% of the neurons in the pallidum are GABAergic, and there was a very little nucleus which never stained up. This was the subthalamic nucleus. And I said, this is strange. And then I started reading and realized there were people who do networks and circuitries and we put the get things together and suddenly it seemed to make sense. And now I understand that the subsonic nucleus was the key because then people started to target with a deep brain stimulation later on in the monkey. So it, at, at that time I didn't realize the, the, the relevance of, of, of the research the team had done. So you really came into this field of, of movement disorders by your interest in, one could say, neuropharmacology in a way. Yeah, that's correct. <coughs> um, you may be too modest to say that, but I think your discoveries then at the time that you were just de describing were, were seminal. I remember that there were numerous publications in those years that mm. listed you as co-author because you yeah. really were the first yeah. to produce an antibody to 
The first who really worked. That's what I didn't realize this at the time. You know, who really was very instrumental yeah. for many lines of research. I understand. Yes. Now, instead of staying in basic science, um, my wife and myself decided to go back to Germany, and I was lucky enough to be, um, well, to be hired to, be, well, to get a job at the Technical University in Munich. The head is, was at that time Albrecht Struppler, who did stereotactic surgery as a neurology. So I think I'm one of the very few people left who, are, who claim they are neurologists who actually did brain deep, well, thalamotomy, stereotactic surgery. Mm -hmm. And that, of course, increased the amount of interest in Parkinson's disease. But I realized very fast uh, stereotactic surgery is one thing, so I re renewed my interest in pharmacology. And then I understood, well, I mean, it's, it's good to get neurology training in Germany, but you have to go somewhere else. So in 1987, I was, uh, again, lucky to be accepted by David Marston. Mm -hmm. We have been in London with Andrew Lee, so we know exactly the power London has in respect to neurology. And David Marston just, uh, well, I mean, he trained, tried to train me <laughs> how to do movement disorders. And in addition, we did fetal cell transplants in monkey. So again, something totally different, but opening again my perspective on, on the interaction of basic right. science and clinical science. You already <coughs> mentioned very important figures in our field. Right. David Marston, of course. Yeah. Also, as far as German-speaking neurology goes, Albrecht Struppler was an influential, right. neurophysiologically oriented, but unique person in, in I agree. surgery. Yeah. Any other <coughs> people that you, th uh, looking back, think were yeah. very important to you, served as models for your, your own approach to yeah. neurology? Well, uh, after the year in London, I returned to Munich, but this time to the other university, and the head was, at that time, Thomas Brandt. And I must say, this person really impressed me because he, he was absolutely straight and clear-cut, making decisions, making mistakes, taking big mistakes, taking the mistakes back. So he ran a huge department in a way I was really admiring him. So I think he really uh, tried to, to demonstrate how to run a good department. And uh, yeah, that's it. So Thomas is the third one. Yeah. You mentioned <coughs> an exciting development that began to, to, to take place and that you were involved with in the very beginning. That was uh, cell transplants as a mm. new treatment for Parkinson's disease. And mm. I remember David Marston at the time in the late 1980s was teaming up with the Lund team. Right, yes. Mm -hmm. If you <coughs> looking back, um, what do you think now were the most important breakthroughs and development in the field of Parkinson's movement disorders uh, that you yourself were part of or at least were closely connected with, you could observe in your career? Would, uh, yeah. would, would you single out there? Uh, the first one was MPTP, which happened to be next door of my lab at NIH. Mm -hmm. So I, I eventually realized they have an animal model which mimics the dopamine deficit. It's clear now that this is not Parkinson's disease, but it, it revolutionized the approach to develop symptomatic therapy. The second step was when I back in, was back in Munich, when we tried to develop a model for trophic factors. Trophic factors was a big thing. It's coming back now, very surprisingly. And we, together with Jürgen Sauter and Sauer, we developed a model of slow degeneration due to the toxin, 6-hydroxydopamine, which allowed to test trophic factors. Mm -hmm. But the cell transplants, I think, at that time was premature. Now coming with the stem cells, this is a totally different issue. But it was just very difficult to perform fetal cell transplants due to all the ramifications. The other thing is, 1994, which is of course uh, a time before I just moved to Marburg, when the genes came in. I think the genetic field revolutionizes movement disorders. There's no question. And that led back to the fact to 1912 when Louis, Levy Louis, uh, reported the Louis body, which actually shows protein aggregation. And uh, I think looking back, 1994 is the key year for at least Parkinson research in, 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 in the last hundred years. We, of course, here, as said, <coughs> at the International Congress on Parkinson's Disease and Movement Disorders, uh, organized by MDS. Mm -hmm. uh, speaking about MDS, a society that you were deeply involved with and have been for many years, mm -hmm. um, 
How would you judge the role? What is your, your take on the importance of MDS for the field of movement disorders? It's, uh, it's unbelievable, to be honest. 1986, I became a member. We have been together for the last 30 years. Yes, right. And it has told me how different people approach basic science, clinical science, how different cultures are. So it makes you really modest if you look at people under conditions which are extremely difficult. They're able to do good research. Then that friendship, how people get compromises, agree, fight, and then again get compromises, how you structure a society. The MDS was a very small uh, society. How you organize a conference, how you organize a report, very simple. So I learned so much for my professional life. It's, I'm extremely grateful, to be honest. You know, it's You've, of course, made a magnificent career yeah, in true. neurology <laughs> and uh, in the field of movement disorders and yeah. Parkinson's. You uh, became chairman and director of the Department of Neurology at Marburg University in Germany after Munich. Right. Um, I think you now have received a very prestigious award. Yeah. Uh, Hertie's senior professorship. It's, it allows me to go back to basic and clinical science beyond the usual time of retiring. So I can go another six years. It's fantastic. Now, this is a, a model career. Mm -hmm. um, were there any, looking back, were there any barriers that you met with uh, that you think might even be relevant for today's younger neurologists? Um, anything of um, note here? Right. I think it's the key is to have someone who supports you, who gives you freedom to do things which may be out of the box, a little bit unusual, who, gi who gives you time. That's the key to think, to make mistakes, to fix the mistakes, and even to say, sorry, I go, and then I go to another place to get the, no the knowledge I need in order to approach a problem I think I like to solve. And that is very difficult now because the economical structure, in, at least even in Europe, cause doctors to try to finish their training as fast as possible to get some type of secure job. So the risk to, the risk to go ab abroad, to, get, to go to a lab, not to do clinical training right after medical examinations, which you all want to do, you know, you want to see the patient, now you want to help the patient, no. I would advise go to a lab because that will train you what science is. You will get a totally different view to the clinical problem and in the long term it helps you to understand what's happening in, in basic science, what happens, happens in drug development. So with, a, with even a short period, maybe two years of basic science, you, you build something for your whole life which will help you to understand the new developments. You would advise young colleagues yeah. that they should be thinking about when they want to follow academic careers, even in clinical right. neurology movements, that they should be spending time abroad or in a different setting yeah. and, and, and be in the lab and do, do basic science. Right, because it's a, a major achievement to go to a, a place where you, you are a guest, you are welcome, but they expect you to perform and then you manage to perform. So if you have done this, you will succeed if you return the same. So you learn how to become, this is trivial, to become independent, you know, to rely on your own uh, yeah, we have qualities. If you, if you, as you've done many, many times, you've had very successful um, uh, fellows with your, uh, in your team and in your department, mm -hmm. uh, when you give advice, what, what would be your, your, your single most advice that you would want to give the young people who are now at the age when you started? Uh, uh, take the risk. I mean, of course, it has to be a, a somehow uh, calculable risk, but uh -huh. take the risk. If someone offers you a project, you think, God, this is impossible. No, everybody will help you. And the, th the second is try to find people you can train so they are better than you because they will always challenge you, hey, I want to do this. I think that is one of the things I really like, to train young people. Yep. We've, we've been touching upon going back to the achievements that took place or the mm. breakthroughs or the exciting developments that took place in our field. 
over the recent um, two or three decades. Mm. Um, as you look forward, oh. where do you think our field will be going? Oh, um, what would you expect will be the most important future developments, both in research in movement disorders and Parkinson's disease, also in treatment and how we approach patients? Uh, I think uh, at the moment we are uh, witnessing one of the most exciting times ever in neurology because it's the shift from symptomatic therapy to disease modifying therapy and that will be also possible to test because groups who five years bef uh, before used to work alone now merge so these consortia of standardization, like the MSA group, the PSP group, um, they, they will allow uh, clinical trials at a level which has never been possible. So you have the standardized long-term follow-ups, you have the natural history data eventually, and that will all help to, to find out which of the drugs which now come will actually slow down the disease. So if I look back, it's unbelievable what happens at this conference. Alone yesterday, the, the, the study group, MSA, or to do the PSP study group, 10 years ago there was nothing, or virtually nothing. And this was just bubbling from ideas and new projects. It's so impressive. Yeah, so you Very would say impressive. there has been also a big, big rise in, in networking and yeah, forming that's the term, research that's right. associates. That, that has been facilitated by MDS, yeah. absolutely clear. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's a big, big, uh, plus for MDS to do this. <coughs> and um, if, we, if we think a little bit about uh, where you yourself, you mentioned you have this prestigious research mm. Uh, mm. professorship, and what, where, where would you like to be going in those coming six years where you have the freedom yeah. to do research? Mm. What, what, where are you going to put well, your uh, my, efforts? My f hobby or favorite is now prodromal. Parkinson's disease, and uh, due to the fact that I also have interest in sleep, you know, restless legs, uh, I was lucky that uh, I could relatively easily combine sleep and Parkinson's disease. So REM sleep behavior disorder turned out to be a very specific prodromal phase. So um, collaborating with other groups will allow to phenotype RBD and do different uh, investigations so you can actually say which will be the best investigation for testing therapeutical responses and which parameter will mimic best the progression of the disease before we see neurological symptoms. So the challenge is to find a biomarker, to use this term, which uh, reflects the progression in the prodromal stage. And I hope that in the six years, we will contribute to this. This is really... You, you've been one of the ones in our, in our society, certainly, and in the field, who's, who's been extremely active with multiple activities. You, you acquired major networking grants in Germany and in Europe. Uh, you've stretched out across the Atlantic. I'm just thinking of the uh, nicotine trial that you've right. uh, <coughs> implemented along the lines you were just mm -hmm. discussing of trying mm -hmm. to be, develop modifying, disease modifying therapies for PD. That means a lot of work. Mm. Oh, And yeah. <laughs> there is, of course, other things to life right. and neurology, research. How, how did you manage in, in your life this, this quote-unquote work-life balance problem um, that we, we all face in, in, in some way or other, and what is your <coughs> advice for others, younger, younger people specifically, how they should be dealing with this? Well, it all sounds trivial. I think the key is two things. To find something which allows you to recover, and this is hiking. Mm -hmm. I play a little bit of piano, but hiking is the key. And the other one is to have a partner who understands what you do. And I was very lucky. So. Good. Oh, that's, that's almost like, like a, a closing <laughs> remark. Um, anything you would, as we, as we draw to a close, anything that you would leave behind as a message for those who are, or those younger ones that are specifically organized in MDS, um, the young colleagues who see MDS as, as, as a society where they can not only communicate and get new information and access to research, but present their own results, um, 
What's your final word as we close the interview? Well, I would s stress get in get involved, engage yourself. It takes time, but you will definitely be rewarded but with friendship, with networking, with good projects, with getting your ideas, seeing young people you may hire or you'd like to attract or you, s you meet people, you send your young people in. So it's so important to look up out of the box. That's the key. And MDS is absolutely great for that. Wolfgang, well, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. um, I know that you will continue with your activities Hope and so. your <laughs> energy inside the society and, and beyond. Um, and I think we're both going, to, both going to enjoy the continuing Congress here in Berlin. Thank you so thank much. You. Thank you.